There we go. Okay, so we talked about hypertension. Diuresis, you heard me say, is a high urine flow. And you heard me talk about diabetes mellitus versus diabetes insipidus. Diabetes means high urine flow. Mellitus means of sweet taste. That's because you had the glucose urea being a problem. In diabetes insipidus, glucose urea is not a finding you find, <laughs> which was redundant. You don't have the glucose urea. But there are similarities between the two. There's a high urine output. In diabetes mellitus, you could also expect to find ketone urea. You would have ketone bodies, or fixed keto acids coming out in the urine as well because the person is relying on fat metabolism. And remember, all roads lead to the mitochondria, and the first entrance step into the Krebs cycle is that oxaloacetate, which is carbohydrate-derived. Um, polydipsia is a term to refer to a lot of uh, drinking water, seeking water. And I like to think of a ladle dipping into water, so that helps me remember polydipsia is excessive thirst and drinking. In diabetes mellitus, you don't need to write this down. I just want to remind you because I have talked about it before. There are three polys and three pathies. The polys mean something that they do a lot of. So polyurea, a lot of urine. Polydipsia, polyphagia, which means... I know what it is. <laughs> when it gets quiet in here, I realize that my YouTube video is playing. So that's what I was like. I hear my annoying voice. Who's playing my video? Stop it. Um. Anyway, so the three polys and then the three pathies, as I said, are the pathological findings. They all deal with neuronal function, or eventually. Um, so there's retinopathy, and there's neuropathy, and then there's even a dysfunction that occurs in the kidneys, which will lead to the nephrons losing their function. So that's nephropathy. So neuropathy, retinopathy, those two definitely are neuronal dysfunction. And the neuronal dysfunction also can impair renal function because the sympathetic division innervates the kidney. There leads to a change in filtration in the early stages of diabetes mellitus. They get an increased GFR, but then as their filtration membrane becomes so damaged and replaced with scar tissue, they get a decreased GFR. So they're all kind of all over the place when it comes to renal function. Um, again, take pathophys if you want to learn more about that. Please don't take pathophys. I don't want to have to grade all the essays. <laughs> don't enroll. <laughs> I don't want more work. I'm being facetious. You can't. So the, the diuretics that I'm going to tell you about, we're going to go through the nephron. And I'm going to go through the nephron. Um, bit by bit, so proximal convoluted tubule, well, Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, descending limb of the loop of Henle, hairpin turn, ascending limb, early distal convoluted tubule, late distal convoluted tubule. And as I go through the nephron, I'm going to tell you which di diuretic works where and how. So an osmotic diuretic, like mannitol, mannitol is a sugar. We cannot have the patient ingest this because they would digest it, and the mannitol would no longer be an osmotic diuretic. It is freely filtered, and it is not reabsorbed. So if you have more solute in the filtrate, just like my analogy yesterday with a low flow toilet, if you have more filtrate, uh, solute in the filtrate, and it can't be reabsorbed, then you're going to have more obligatory water loss to try and get that solute flushed out of your body. That's the reason why we have to inject it, because if the person ingests it, they would break it down to a simple sugar, 
and then it would not have an osmotic effect because the glucose would be reabsorbed. So inject it as mannitol. It is freely filtered, but there are no mannitol carriers in the proximal convoluted tubule. If you have more solute, then you must have more water that goes with it to flush it out of the system. <clears throat> then we get to a loop diuretic. Now, please understand that this loop diuretic does not target the entire loop. It targets the thick ascending limb. In particular, it blocks the sodium 2-chloride potassium co-transporter of the thick ascending limb. If you block that co-transporter, then that means more solute stays in the filtrate. And again, it requires more water to flush that solute out of your body, hence the diuresis. There is a potential danger to this loop diuretic called furosemide or Lasix. The danger is if the person abuses it, it can lead to hypokalemia because again, it's blocking the co-transporter and you're not reabsorbing as much potassium. Many times when a person is prescribed furosemide, they might be put on a second diuretic. And the second diuretic you're going to see in about two more slides. And that diuretic, the second one that they might be put on, and again, it depends on the patient and the doctor, is called a potassium sparing diuretic. They're put on that other diuretic to offset the potassium loss from the furosemide. Because again, potassium imbalance can kill very quickly. So I'm going to get to that in two slides. In the early distal convoluted tubule, we have thiazide that works here. And thiazide blocks the sodium chloride co-transporter. Thiazide blocks it on the apical side. And that means you can't reabsorb the sodium and chloride. And remember, at this area, we have about 5% of our original sodium filtered load that we're reabsorbing here. So if we block that, then the sodium chloride stays. And again, the trend holds more solute. You require more water to flush it out of your body. This is not the potassium sparing diuretic that I was referring to a slide ago. Now I'm going to tell you about potassium sparing diuretics. These target the late distal convoluted tubule. These are going after aldosterone sites. So they're going after the principal cells. There are two I want you to know, spironolactone, and on the next slide, I'm, I'm going to show you amylaride. So spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist, and it works inside the cell. It binds to the aldosterone receptor. Remember, aldosterone is a steroid, and steroid receptors are found intracellularly. Spironolactone is going to block that aldosterone receptor, and that means you're going to get fewer sodium-potassium ATPases and fewer of the leak channels on the apical membrane then that means you won't reabsorb as much sodium and you won't secrete as much potassium. That's why it's called potassium sparing. You won't secrete as much potassium. And this will offset the potassium loss if the person was on furosemide, the Lasix, the loop diuretic that I told you about. There is a nasty side effect, sorry about the man boobs, or the movies, whatever you want to call them. Because it is a steroid, this can also block androgen receptors. So receptors that would respond to testosterone. And therefore, if we're blocking the testosterone receptor, then estrogen gains more control in that person's body. 
So a man might develop gynecomastia, which means breast tissue. A lot of female athlete, athletes that are doing steroids, anabolic steroids, to hide the masculine effects of doing those hormones might take spironolactone to offset the masculinization so people are less suspicious of them. Another potassium sparing hormone or drug, diuretic, is a milleride. A milleride is going to block the apical side of the cells only, blocking those leak channels. Again, if you're not allowing sodium in, you don't allow potassium out, and that means you're losing less potassium. This would again offset the furosemide, which would lead to more potassium loss. They offset each other. But if a person was prescribed a milleride, or as you saw in the previous slide, spironolactone alone, then they would have a different problem with potassium. Because they are potassium sparing, if they were on these diuretics, they might retain too much potassium, and their potassium problem would now be hyperkalemia. Any questions? No? Yes, no. We're good. Okay. All right. Well, then, 